The Ebola virus is making an appearance in yet another country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and that's not good. And corruption rears its ugly head in Puerto Rico, again. All that's coming up on today's Hot Zone. This is the Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, thanks for all the great feedback on yesterday's episode. I'm off tomorrow on my biggest trip yet this year. Four continents, seven countries, and 56,000 air miles over the next three weeks. I'll be in Nigeria reporting on Boko Haram and ISIS, then off to South Africa, where I'll be reporting on the crime wave there and murder of white farmers, and then off to Afghanistan, where I'll get to visit the troops, specifically my son Mason, and get to embed with his medevac unit for a few days, and I'm really looking forward to that. So over the next few days, I'm going to be airing some uh, some original content and some rerun content from earlier this year. All of it's really good stuff, and I'll be filling in with whatever I can manage to produce while I'm out on the road. Okay, before I get to the big stories for today, I just want to comment on a shooting that took place in the northern Iraqi city of Erbil yesterday, uh, someplace I'm very familiar with. A Turkish diplomat was gunned down inside a popular restaurant in a highly secure part of the city. In fact, the offices of the security team that took care of us when I was there with Oliver North a couple years ago are located in the same building as the restaurant where this guy got murdered. Uh, It's got the kind of the whole city in an uproar because the sort of thing really doesn't happen in Kurdistan. It's normally a very safe place. I'd Gladly take my family there on vacation. So here's a little video I shot while I was in Erbil back in February. I'm walking around downtown Erbil. This is the capital of Kurdistan. It's a actually very safe, kind of cosmopolitan place. You have all different religions and uh, people groups, Yazidi and Druze and Kurds and Iraqis and they all kind of get along here they very very rare to have like a bombing or an attack or anything happen here and uh, they they're very tolerant of each other's beliefs so it's proof that it can be done in in Iraq and in the Middle East I mean this place does it their their culture is very accepting of other other ideologies and beliefs and they all live together probably because they really don't have any Shia here uh, and it seems like Shia tend to be the catalyst that kind of sets everybody off, I think. Uh, we just went by the Citadel in downtown Kurdistan, uh, downtown Erbil. Right in the center of downtown, there's a, a kind of a plat- plateau around. The, it's a tell, uh, which is a, a series of civilizations that built were built on top of each other. Uh to the point where this thing's 100 feet tall it's about 6,000 years old Uh, it's been they say it's the oldest continuously inhabited site in the world Uh, Alexander the Great uh, I think was coronated or something there king of Asia something like that Uh, Genghis Khan fought there six successive Roman empires fought the Persians uh, right there, right here. I mean, right here where we are, uh, the, the Citadel's just a couple blocks over over that direction. And uh, right over here to my left, I'll spin around. I, you probably can't see it, but back there is the mosque, the main mosque in uh, in Erbil. Uh, actually, a very nice city. Uh, I would not hesitate to bring my family here on vacation or. Uh, bring my wife here or something. I mean, it's not especially beautiful. I have to be honest about that. There's not a lot of, uh, you know, like tourist attractions or shopping or anything. But at the same time, uh, you know, it's interesting for sure. Different way of life. So uh, I've been here quite a few times uh, over the course of the last 10 years or so. And I've always enjoyed it. The food is very good, that's for sure. And the people are super friendly. There's this guy that's following me around here, and I I can't get him to leave me alone. I don't know I don't know what's wrong with this guy. I think he likes me or something. I love I've, American people. Oh, you like Americans, huh? Yeah, I, I like see. Americans. Okay. Well, 
if you really love me, you'll get me some mirrors for my Land Cruiser. You know? This is chicken kebab for lunch. Uh, we've already had soup. Uh, this salad, hummus, uh, there's bread. This is just kind of a normal lunch, right? Yeah. Awesome. Anyway, there have been a lot of tensions between the Kurds and the Turks as of late, as they both have laid claim to the Syrian region known as Rojava, and this won't make things any better between them. The Iranians bombed the Kurds also uh, near the Iranian border over the last few days, and I'm sure that involves some of the troops that I interviewed with when I was there earlier this year. They, all of them died. So there were how many people out here? Uh, around here, I don't know exactly right now, but we lose uh, 14 percent. 14 people got killed right here. Uh, no, uh, all, all five around. Five or six here. Okay. But another uh, six also inside in the meeting. In, inside. In the and meeting. this whole building was just gone. Gone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so they had to rebuild all that. Yeah, they built everything. Except for, you can see here. Oh, can you see this photo? Yeah, well, yeah, woman. Well, woman. Yeah. There was a leader in everything. They, they are martyr in a missile attack. Oh, those there two was women. Anyone, yes. Oh, okay. Meanwhile, the bombing by Assad's forces and the Russians continues in Idlib and in northern Syria. Uh, that's causing lots more civilian casualties. The Kurds who make up the Syrian Democratic Forces already have their hands full with tens of thousands of former ISIS wives in several camps. And those places are really starting to get out of control. Uh, a couple days ago, somebody raised an ISIS flag over the al Hol camp. And the video shows lots of kids dancing around the flagpole shouting Allah Akbar. So that's great. Um, ISIS is, as an idea is obviously alive and well in many places around the world and especially Syria. So great. That's wonderful. It's really a difficult question of what to do with these ISIS kids. I mean, how do you reprogram when their mothers are still true believers? I mean, I'm glad that's not my job. I'd say send a bunch of Christian missionaries in there and do your best to convert them all. Because if you don't change their hearts, you can have a real hard time changing their minds. All right, let's move on to Puerto Rico, where protests are happening after evidence of massive corruption has come to light inside the government. I know that's a big surprise to everybody. A lot of it has to do with the billions of dollars in aid money that was pumped into Puerto Rico after the uh, 2017 hurricane that all but wiped the island protectorate right off the map. So, uh, so far, hundreds of thousands of people have moved to the U.S. mainland, and that will definitely have a profound effect on the 2020 election. Mark my words. But... It turns out the leaders on the island were directing a whole lot of that aid money, uh, not to where it was needed most, but to their cronies. Same song, different verse. Puerto Rico has always been known for its massive corruption, and I really found that out when I was there covering the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria was the most powerful hurricane to hit this island in more than 80 years. It was essentially like a 60-mile-wide tornado that just hit a bullseye on the, the nation of Puerto Rico. It was so powerful that it blew paint off the walls and blew bark off trees, but it also essentially destroyed the entire power system. As we drive around here, almost every power pole is damaged down, broken. They're not going to be able to just repair this. They're going to have to basically rebuild it from the ground up. But that's going to be a very difficult proposition because Puerto Rico was in bad shape before the storm. Uh, what I mean is that the government uh, of Puerto Rico has been funding its operations with debt for decades. Uh, they've been selling bonds to U.S. investors and eventually the cost of that debt got so high that they were unable to even pay the interest on it and they defaulted back in July. So now they're unable to even borrow money for maintenance and operations. Many of the employees of the local power company found out that they were going to default and were afraid they were going to lose their pensions. And so about 600 of them quit and took an early retirement before they defaulted on that debt. What that means is that the local power company here doesn't even have enough employees to do maintenance on the whole system, much less repairs. In addition to that, 
during the Obama administration, about $170 million was earmarked for what they called green energy, that is windmills and solar farms. Well, guess what? Those things were also completely destroyed in this hurricane. It's going to be months before everybody on Puerto Rico gets their power back, and how they're going to pay for it is anybody's guess. So we went and talked to some people that are sort of on the end of the line, that'll probably be the last ones to get electricity again, to see what it's been like for them already and what it's going to probably be like in the future. Nilda Perales lives in a small village on the coast where the storm first made landfall. Entonces, pues llorando que llueva para pa llenar el, para podernos bañar y eso. Her grandsons are learning to live without modern pastimes. And rumors are they won't have light until well into 2018. Yo tengo fe que sea menos, que sea menos porque no es fácil decir. Nearby cell towers are also knocked out. One of the biggest security issues in the recovery has been protecting these sites from vandals and looters who steal generators, fuel, and even copper wire. But Nilda says one thing has improved, face-to-face -face relationships with her neighbors. These kinds of challenges represent the new normal for most Puerto Ricans in what has become the longest lasting power outage in American history. We traveled next to the suburb of Bayamon near Puerto Rico's capital San Juan. Young people there from around Latin America had been stranded without contact from their loved ones since the storm. They are students at a small Christian university making the best of a bad situation. Chapel services continued by lantern light and we donated our sat phone so they could call their families. This brought much needed smiles to their faces. According to the website status.pr, the island should have nearly all water service restored by the end of 2017. Most grocery stores and gas stations are now operational, and many hotels are open again as well. But what those hotels are lacking are tourists. We're waiting really to see what's going to happen. I'm very discouraged about the internet, communication, all of that is very, everything's down right now. Already stretched thin by two previous major hurricanes in Houston and Florida, FEMA scrambled to get aid to the beleaguered island. More than 15,000 troops, contractors, and federal employees responded to the crisis, bringing in so much aid that getting it out of the port became a major bottleneck. Came upon this big line of people and wondered what they're, what's going on. It turns out they've got an ice machine going over here and they're giving away bags of ice. My name is Erica Rodriguez. I live in Bayamon. I just got the water back last night and yeah we're just standing in the, in the line for ice. The effects of this crisis will continue to be felt for decades and not just here on the island. Many drug companies produce their products in Puerto Rico and having to shutter their plants for months is causing shortages of necessary medicines across the U.S. And as hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans flee the hardships of their home soil for the state of Florida, what was a hotly contested swing state may come to rest solidly in democratic territory. And that could have a serious impact on American politics in the 2020 presidential election. And that means the fate of Puerto Rico should still be a major concern for all of us. So protesters are now calling for the governor of Puerto Rico to step down, and that would probably happen, I would say, uh, if I had to guess, considering the dirt that they've found on him. Uh, let's hope they don't replace him with the mayor of San Juan, who is an outright socialist, without a doubt. All right, on to Congo. Bad news came in over the last few days uh, that a Congolese pastor, this is Democratic Republic of Congo, in the eastern city of Goma there, uh, contracted Ebola, and it has many locals there really worried. In the town of Beni, Congo, aid workers were giving out the Ebola vaccine, which is developed in part by Ellen Joe Barron, who we've had here on the podcast a couple of times. People in Congo often respond violently to efforts to administer that vaccine, since primitive thinking kind of goes that the medics are there actually infecting people with the virus. So a real challenge for those combating this on the front lines. If you haven't seen it, let me recommend a powerful documentary about the Ebola epidemic that was filmed by my friend David Darg. And Darg is one of my heroes, and he was nominated for an Oscar for his coverage of Ebola back in 2014. 
So world health officials are saying this is a game changer as Goma is a regional hub for travelers from all over Africa, which is kind of surprising to me considering the primitive state of the place uh, when I was there. That's just a little hard to believe. We also need to scale up the response in order to deal with the high risk of the virus spreading further. You know already that we've had a case in Uganda. You've seen the reports of a recent case in Goma. Unless we're able to scale up to deal with the risk of spread, again, we will not be successful in getting to zero cases. So I'm going to keep following this story, and especially as I spend the next week or so in Africa, Ebola is no joke, and Africa is the perfect storm of humanity that could infect and possibly kill millions of people. This makes, I think, four countries now where it's killed people, and that's just in this most recent outbreak, not counting the one back in 2014. With all the people that are fleeing the violence in Congo, it could easily hitch a ride to the Western Hemisphere with one of the migrants that we've reported on over the last several weeks. So that's all I have for today, folks. I appreciate you watching. Keep checking my Facebook page for updates and photos from my trip, and I'll do my best to update it as often as possible while I'm out there. I hope you'll be with me. Thanks for watching. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.